Good evening, everyone. Tonight we're learning about plankton with Dr. Pearson from Horn Point Lab, University of Maryland Center for Environmental uh, Science. And Dr. Pearson, we're so glad that you are able to be with us tonight and share your knowledge and expertise. And we are so uh, excited and anxious to learn from you. So I'm just going to turn it over to you right now so we can start learning. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I really want, I really appreciate, oh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm getting a weird something from my computer. Can you hear me now still? Okay, great. I'm not going to worry about the error that popped up and I'm just going to charge ahead. And can you see my screen? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for, for tuning in. Thank you so much for the invitation here. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. And like Bronwyn said, um, if you have questions, um, please feel free to, um, to uh, put them in the chat and Bronwyn will stop me and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so uh, be, as I get started, um, so tonight, it's, I call this Plankton 101. This is a version of a seminar that I've given to a lot of different groups, a lot of teacher groups. Uh, I work with Living Classrooms in Baltimore. I've done this for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I've done it at the uh, Maryland Outdoor Educators and Environmentalists uh, uh, Conference in the past. I tried to adjust it a little bit. Like Bronwyn said, I, I don't consider myself a naturalist, but I love hanging out with naturalists. Um, I know a lot about a very narrow topic. I'm, I'm a zooplankton ecologist primarily. Um, and hopefully I can share some of that with you. Um, as we get going, I just wanted to introduce myself so you know who I am. Um, I'm from the East Coast originally. I grew up in New Jersey. I went to University of New Hampshire for college. Uh, I worked for a while in an oceanography program um, called Globec at the uh, at University of Rhode Island, the Graduate School of Oceanography. I went out on a lot of boats and collected a lot of plankton and then brought those back and counted them um, and actually fell in love with this, this field uh, of zooplankton ecology during it, partly because of the people, partly because I got to go out on boats, and partly because there's this fantastic world that you find under the microscope, as I'm sure a lot of you all um, know about, at least in, you know, there's, there's all different worlds under the microscope. I happen to fall in love with the, the ocean, the, the planktonic um, organisms in the ocean. So at that point, I went out to the West Coast in Seattle, and I did my graduate work at the University of Washington. I came back to the East Coast uh, at Horn Point, where I uh, started as a postdoc and um, have kind of, I was able to bring some money in, work on projects. If you bring money in, people don't kick you out. And so I've kind of been manufacturing career uh, positions for myself over the years. So I'm, I'm now an associate professor uh, for the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science and I'm based in Cambridge. So a lot of what I do, I just want to mention my funding agencies because that's what's gotten all of this work going. Uh, I've had work funded by NSF, NOAA, NASA, uh, Maryland Sea Grant, the Waterfowl Foundation um, primarily. So um, some of the projects I've worked on are uh, copepods in, in hypoxic waters or in dead zones. I'm going to mention that very briefly. And if we want to dig into it more, I could talk about it for days, but we don't have days today. Um, I have a project working with a group of people, and we're actually trying to estimate zooplankton using satellite data. We call it zooplankton from space. How hard can it be? Turns out it's pretty hard, but uh, we're, we're making progress. Um, I do a bit of work on zooplankton feeding, mostly copepods, on cytotoxic prey, so prey that produce toxins and that, that have negative effects on the, on the zooplankton. Uh, I'm working with another group looking at larval fish feeding and how selective they are for different types of plankton. And I'm gonna mention that briefly in my talk. We're using genetic tools actually to probe what's in the guts and what's in the, in the um, plankton samples. Uh, a new project that's really exciting, looking at mycid shrimp. So these are uh, shrimp that spend most of their time in the mud or on the bottom. And they come up at night to feed. Um, they're they're epi, epipelagic, um, epiplanktonic uh, uh, animals. Um, and they feed on copepods, they feed on phytoplankton and stuff like that. That's just spinning up and I'm, on, I'm doing the copepod part. And then I do a lot of work in Puerto Rico, actually in the bioluminescent bays, uh, working with undergraduate students down there and trying to broaden participation in STEM, um, providing research experiences for them. I haven't had a chance to do a lot of my own work, but I've had a lot of fun doing research projects with the students in the bioluminescent bays. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that some more at the end. 
Okay, so first we wanna just talk a little bit about what is plankton. I think we all kind of know, but I just wanna make sure we're on the same footing as we go forward. And then I wanna talk a little bit about how we know what we know because you know, tiny, tiny animals, I'm gonna focus mostly on zooplankton. We're gonna, I, I will talk about phytoplankton. Uh, my focus is more zooplankton, but you know, I think, I think it's important to understand how we get the information in order to understand what we do know. So that, that gives us an idea of what we don't know and what we need to do and, and the kind of tools that, that we still need to develop in order to really answer the big questions we have. And then um, we're gonna go through that pretty quickly so that we can meet plankton. And so we can talk about some of the local plankton. I'll talk about some of my favorites. I'm gonna focus a little bit on copepods, tell a little story about copepods and mosquitoes. I've got fun facts. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about cryptic species and why, why they, those are important. So um, let's buckle up and see how it goes. Like I said, um, feel free to interrupt. If I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down. If you want me to dig deeper, happy to do all of it. So the term plankton comes from a Greek word, which is uh, loosely translated to mean wanderer or drifter. And it was first coined by Victor Henson. Uh, around 1887. This is a picture of Victor Henson that I found on the web. Um, and the, the important thing to remember about plankton is that they are organisms, all organisms. They can be plants, they can be animals, they can be single cell, they can be multiple cell. Um, but their distribution is driven by where the water goes. Okay, that's what makes them drifters or wanderers. So a lot of them can swim and many of them are very strong swimmers, but as an oceanographer, we learned that the horizontal currents of the ocean are much stronger than the vertical currents. So the, most of the plankton, if they're gonna swim, they swim up and down because they're not, they can't swim against the horizontal currents. So if you map the distributions of species of plankton, they map very tightly with the major currents of the ocean. And so we can use them actually as tracers, different types of plankton we can, can, can be used as tracers to define certain water masses or types of water and things like that. And that becomes really important in like paleo-oceanography where we look at, um, where we look at uh, cores in the mud from the sediments and we can actually determine what the overlying water was like at different periods in history by seeing the types of plankton that are preserved there, okay? so. That's the, that's the really key thing. They can be animals, they can be plants, they can be single cell, they can be, they can be multiple multicellular organisms, but they're all drifting around in the water and where they're found is largely determined by where that water is going and not how they're swimming. <coughs> so um, this is sort of a, these, these two slides are ones I, I usually keep in almost all of my talks just be, so that again, we're on the same footing. And this is the why should you care about organisms so small? And, and the thing is, and, and the reason is because of the, um, this is a food chain here. We know it's not quite as simple as all of this, but generally speaking, the phytoplankton are the plants of the sea. They're using nutrients in the water and the energy of the sun to grow. They get eaten by the zooplankton, which are the animals. Those get eaten by fish and that gets eaten by us, right? Now, in the late, it was really not until the 1970s uh, and early 80s that we really had an appreciation for the tiny little things. And we realized how complicated this, this food web really is. Um, in 1983, there was a paper that, that described what was called the microbial loop. And this is the, um, the, the tiny, primarily single-celled organisms that are mostly between about uh, one micron and maybe 10 or 20 microns large that are eating each other and cycling a lot of energy before it ever makes it up into the zooplankton or the fish. And so um, this microbial loop is, is, is doing a, a, a lot of metabolizing and actually really driving a lot of the biochemistry and biogeochemistry of the world's oceans. <clears throat> and it's really exciting and interesting, but it's also really, really confusing because a lot of the organism, a lot of the single cell um, protists that are considered part of the microzooplankton are, we try to, we classify them as plant, phytoplankton or zooplankton, but many of them, almost all of them, with a few exceptions, are actually doing both at once. So a lot of them can photosynthesize and they can also eat at the same time. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that just because it's so interesting. 
regardless of how complicated it is, if you want to boil it down to something that's really important to humans, zooplankton eat phytoplankton and fish eat zooplankton. And it's not often that you see plankton mentioned in the funny pages. And so I keep this, uh, this little cartoon from back in 2004 uh, in, in a lot of my slides, because we all know that whales feed on, on plankton, um, right? Or baleen whales, anyway. Baleen whales feed on plankton. So that's a quick intro to, to some of the ideas about plankton. Now, because we're going to talk about different types of plankton, I just want to get a couple more definitions out there. We have the organismal definitions of phytoplankton, which are the plants. These are the ones that are photosynthesizing. We have the zooplankton, which are, we call them animals, but actually it's anything that eats, that is going to um, grow heterotrophically. So they're anything that ingests. These could be single-celled organisms that we wouldn't necessarily consider um, animals. They, the protists, a lot of the protists that ingest other particles in order to grow are considered zooplankton. Um, and then I put on there bacterial plankton. So the bacteria and the archaea, all the um, prokaryotes, are also part of the plankton. I didn't include vi uh, uh, viruses, but there are a lot of viruses in the water. Um, in fact, for every one uh, milliliter of water, we make a broad estimate that there's about 10 to the seventh viruses. So that's about 10 million viruses in every milliliter of water, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. There's about a million bacteria in each milliliter of water. <laughs> And then as we get up to larger and larger organisms, obviously there's fewer and fewer. Not a lot of whales in a milliliter of water, um, but there are going to be quite a few protists um, in, the, in the hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands in, in many cases, depending on where you are in the water. We also divide up the plankton by life history divisions. So think the marrow plankton, um, which I'll mention a couple of times, these are the part-time plankton. These are the things that are gonna grow up to be something else. So this includes a lot of the um, larger crustaceans, crabs and shrimp, um, and even barnacles are, marrow, are, are crustaceans that are meroplankton. Um, a lot of the mollusks like the bivalves and, and things like that, and even a lot of fish are considered marrow, uh, have a meroplanktonic stage. They have larval stages that are, um, that are planktonic. They drift around, they can't swim very strongly, and so they're, they're pushed around and dispersed through the action of the currents of the water. The holoplankton are the full-time plankton. That's the stuff that I work on primarily and copepods like we're gonna talk about. Um, they're not gonna grow up to be anything else. So, you know, as big as they are as adults are, uh, a lot of the ones I look at are in the, the one and two millimeter range um, as adults and they're not gonna turn into anything else. And then a word that you'll you may come across if, if you are digging around in this, in this field is tycoplankton. And these are kind of the accidental plankton. So these are things that might get broken off, the, the, uh, that, that might be primarily benthic and they might be washed up into the plankton and caught in plankton samples at times. And they might be able to make a living there even. Uh, I did a lot of work on George's Bank off of Cape Cod and, and we did some work on um, benthic hydroids. So these are, these are similar to uh, jellyfish and anemones. But they form these, they're, they're very, very small, and they form these mats of um, basically upside down jellyfish that are all connected. They're, they're a colonial organism, but they get big storms come through and they get broken off and they can make a living in the plankton. They can live in the plankton and eat and they can be very voracious predators. So these are the accidental plankton or the, the uh, unintentional plankton, maybe. Uh, and then we have size divisions. And I just want to mention this because um, it's really an operational definition, these different sizes, and it's based, this, this was sort of developed by a guy named John Seaberth in the late 1970s, and it, it happened that he, he had uh, different sieves of these mesh sizes, and so he named all of his different plankton based on how he could, how he could differentiate them going through his sieves. Um, and so it's still useful today because these size classes uh, we use these, we still have those same size sieves and, we, and we, we organize a lot of our thoughts around these different size classes and size is important um, as far as trophic transfer and other things, but, um, but that's where it comes from. So this is a, just a chart that I made up for a textbook that is uh, hopefully going to be published in the next year or two on um, estuarine ecology. I just wrote the zooplankton chapter. And each of these divisions shows the different organismal size divisions like I had in the other 
um, in that previous slide. And I just put the names of lots of the, the dominant estuarine plankton um, on this slide with some pictures. So the copepods are usually in this, say, 200 micron to 2 millimeter range, depending on what stage they're in. Uh, the larvae of other crustaceans and uh, things like clodocerins, like daphnia um, and other clodocerins that we might find in freshwater, they're in this, say, two, uh, one or two millimeter stage. Things like polychaete worms are in the, are in the millimeter range. Uh, decapod larvae, so this would be crabs and things like that. Echinoderm larvae are also in that range. They're things like starfish and sea cucumbers and, and um, uh, uh, sea urchins and things like that. Fish larvae can range in a lot of different sizes, but the planktonic fish larvae are, are around here. Uh, and then we get into bigger things that don't swim really well, but are, so are considered plankton, like the jellyfish, like tinafores, which we find in the bay, um, and ketogonats, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. They're their own phylum. Um, and they're arrow worms, they're voracious predators, they're found throughout the ocean, we find them in the saltier parts of the bay um, in the summers. Um, and they're, they're really, really cool. And they're about, they're a couple centimeters long usually, you can see them with the naked eye. Uh, and then mycid shrimp, which I mentioned before. In the smaller size range, there's lots and there's a huge diversity of heterotrophic and mixotrophic fat flagellates. So mixotrophs, is the, when I was talking about the organisms that can both photosynthesize and they can take in particles heterotrophically, we call them mixotrophs. And they're a huge part of, they're, they're, there's a huge push to understand them better now. Um, because, we're, because now we know that with the exception of the diatoms, almost every other protist group we find in the ocean at least has some members that are mixotrophic, if not all of them. So a lot of the dominant protists that we see around here are ciliates and dinoflagellates, and almost every single one that we interrogate turns out it's mixotrophic or can be mixotrophic. And they use this as a strategy to hedge their bets. You know, in the winter, there's not as much sunlight, and so you might ramp down your photosynthetic capability and you might start eating particles that are around you in order to make a living. Um, or if the nutrients uh, in the summer, if the nutrients get used up by a big phytoplankton bloom, you might switch over to eating those phytoplankton instead of trying to photosynthesize and, and, um, and take in a lot of nutrients that have been used up by those blooms. So they're really fascinating and I'll talk to them, talk about them a little bit more. And then Bronwyn mentioned um, the uh, oxygen that we're breathing and, it's, and the plankton's importance in it. I don't have a lot of pictures of phytoplankton. I'm going to go back for a second. This picture in the middle from the plankton slide are a number of diatoms. So diatoms are a really interesting group of, of, um, of phytoplankton. They're primarily phytoplankton. They don't eat. They have a silica frustule. They don't swim. They form long chains in a lot of cases, but they're, they're it, it's been estimated that they're responsible for up to 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere at any given time. So the ocean itself is responsible probably for 50 to 60% of the oxygen in the atmosphere through uh, photosynthesis of the whole suite of, of um, photosynthesizers that live in the ocean near the surface. Uh, but diatoms themselves are, are thought to be um, uh, uh, responsible for up to 20%. And they're real important food for lots of uh, the zooplankton out there. Okay, so um, that was a big nasty chart about um, the sizes of plankton. And now I wanna give you an example of what, what this means. Because if you noticed on that chart, this is actually on a log scale, which means every division is, every major division is 10 times the size of the previous major division. So we go from 200 nanometers to two microns, to 20 microns, to 200, et cetera, et cetera. That means there's a huge size range of things that we consider plankton, <clears throat> seven to eight orders of magnitude. And this slide is meant to give you an idea of that with some of the ones that are dominant or that are, are common in the Chesapeake Bay. So I don't have a picture of the, the little protistin flagellates that might be 10 microns, but this little dot is one pixel, well, Underneath of it, I had to put the, the dots on the end so we could see the, the, the size of these um, lines. If, this, if you considered this one pixel, that would be 
um, the size of a flagellate. 10 times bigger than that would be these diatoms, dinoflagellates, and ciliates. They grow up to about 100 microns. Most of them are going to be 30 to 30, well, say, say 20 to 30 or 40 microns, but they can grow up to about 100 microns. So for our uh, purposes here, um, if we consider this about 10 microns and one tenth the size of that would be the, the size of about a, a bacteria. So just on this slide alone, then we go up to the copepods, we're talking about about a millimeter, and then the mycids are about a centimeter. So on this slide alone, we're, we're looking at four orders of magnitude in size. All of these things could be caught in one of our plankton nets, or, in a, or we might catch them in a water sample uh, that we put under the microscope. So it creates, to, to sample and to understand each of these different organisms takes a whole different suite of tools because they're in such different size classes. And I don't have a good example of what, um, of, I, and, I, and now, that I'm, now that I'm talking about this, I realize I should have a, an example relative to humans, but something four times, you know, this, if we were the flagellate, something four times the size of us. <coughs> uh, not four times. Um, I'm sorry, a thousand times the size of us would be three orders of magnitude bigger. So these are much, much, there's a huge range of sizes and it, cause, it means that we have to employ lots of different tools to look at these things. Uh, just another mention about the trophic classifications. Um, I wanna really hammer home that most of the single celled eukaryotic plankton are actually mixotrophs because this is a really, because it's fascinating. Um, and there's a lot of work done on it. And in fact, Diane Stecker, who is at Horn Point, was one of the um, leading, uh, the, the people who really led the charge in this work about 30 years ago. And they do think, they do all kinds of different things. Some of them have their own, um, <clears throat> some, of, some of the mixotrophs actually make their own chloroplasts. And some of them engage in this thing called kleptochloroplasty. And kleptochloroplasty means they eat something that contains a, a chloroplast where all the machinery for photosynthesis occurs and they save it and they actually keep that chloroplast running and photosynthesizing until, it, until, until some of the enzymes start to break down and it doesn't work anymore and then they digest it. So some of, the, some of these protists, especially the ciliates and the dinoflagellates, have actually evolved or, or stolen some of the genes to make that chloroplast run for a certain amount of time, um, but they can't build it themselves. So they have to get it from the prey. They can keep it running for a little while. And then once it's done, they just digest it and they go after another one. So it's just a really fascinating and probably terrifying uh, existence to live in the plankton. Um, and that's the other thing I, I usually talk, to, when, I, when I talk to school groups, I say, you know, there's the, the being plankton is probably terrifying because there's nowhere to hide, right? You're just in this, you're in the water. There's, there's no trees to climb to get away from predators. Um, if, you're, if you're up in the water column, you can't really dig into the sediments and the sediments are full of things that want to eat you too. So, um, so, so the, the, way you, the way most of the organisms in the plankton die is by getting eaten, fortunately or unfortunately. Okay. Um, I'll just pause and take a sip of water. If anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about how we know what we know. <clears throat> so because plankton are so small, it's really, really hard to, um, to do work on individuals, especially the protists and the other single-celled uh, prokaryotes like the, the bacteria and the, the archaea. Most of what we know about what's going on with plankton comes from studies of their, of their populations. So this is a, a video taken from the RV Hugh R. Sharp. So this is Delaware's uh, research vessel. Uh, it's part of the University National Oceanographic Laboratory fleet. So there's a fleet of oceanographic vessels. And when you put a proposal into NSF, if, uh, if, if you want to work on these vessels, you, you have to make a ship time request. And if the proposal gets funded, you'll be granted some of the ship time and you can go out and do, um, do your research on it. So this was from a cruise in, I think this was 2013 um, on the Shark. And we deployed one of our net systems and we put a GoPro camera on it just to see what it would see, um, for, so we could we could get the perspective of um, of sampling for plankton um, 
with the net. That's uh, one of my former technicians there, Ginger John, and uh, Catherine Fitzgerald was on the right, and she is uh, currently my uh, graduate student, and she's working on the um, on, on larval on uh, larval fish feeding on on zooplankton. So that's what it looks like if you are a net. Uh, some of the other things that we do, we collect we collect lots of plankton samples using traps and nets. So the traps are basically nets that plankton swim into. Um, we measure all of the conditions in the water using these CTDs, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, and these bottles on there are open on both ends, and we can actually electronically control them to collect depths uh, to collect water samples from specific depths. This net in the uh, this uh, in the on the left hand side, the two pictures are of a mock nest net. That's an electronically controlled net system. So again, we can collect net samples. We drag that through the water, the plankton go into it, um, and they're caught in, a, in a, a bottle at the end, we call a caught end, and we can control the depths at which each of these nets samples. So that gives us a, the ability to look at different depth intervals in the water. These are rated to about uh, 5,000 meters. In the Chesapeake Bay, we only go down to about 20 meters most of the time. Um, but uh, offshore in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, off the shelf in the North Atlantic, we've sampled down to 1,500 meters. And other people have sampled much deeper. Uh, then we get a sample. It looks like this. Um, all of these, all of the, this stuff that looks like goo is just thousands and thousands and thousands of, of individual zooplankton. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, in these samples, I can say with certainty, because I've looked at a number of them, uh, it's primarily copepods, and it's primarily the copepod Akarsha tansa, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Hey, hey, Jamie. Yes. Um, Franklin wanted to know, are most of the plankton free-floating, or are they associated with suspended sediment? Good question. And all of this stuff that I'm talking about are free-floating. Um, there are there are some organisms uh, that are associated with the sediments, uh, with with um, whatever particles that are floating in the water. Um, at that point, they're not really considered plankton anymore. They're they're considered particle associated protists or particle associated bacteria. And then we do have some like things like copepods that actually live. There, there's parasitic ones, um, and whether they're plank they have a planktonic stage, but then they have a parasitic stage. Um, and there's 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 lots of parasitism in the planktonic world. Things that are part-time um, plankton and that are parasites when they find a, a suitable host. So everything I'm talking about is free floating. Great. <clears throat> so then every so so the the nets will get us the plankton, but then we got to figure out what's going on. So this is a picture of my boss in the upper left. Mike Roman, he's the director of Horn Point Lab, and he's uh, actually sorting individual uh, copepods from that dish to do egg production and feeding experiments. So, so we can actually sort using a little pasture pipette individual copepods, and, and we can manipulate um, jars, which you can see here on the right. Each of these jars is filled with uh, water that, that has been manipulated in some way. Maybe, it's, maybe we've added some certain uh, phytoplankton cultures to it. Maybe we've changed the nutrients and we can put copepods in there and we can look at what happens to the community of, of uh, microplankton, I should say, um, all the, the microzooplankton, the phytoplankton and everything in those bottles. We can also put the copepods in little dishes and we can measure egg production and we can do that with lots of different species. So the, the story of plankton that as we understand it is written by these population level studies where we take big net toes and count what's in there kill them and count them, as some people say, um, or these individual experiments um, where, we, where we pick out a few individuals from the many, many millions that we collect um, and, and make behavioral or physiological or biological measurements on them. And, and in my work, I do a little bit of everything. I try to marry those scales. <clears throat> in addition to the net toes, there's also optical sampling. And this is just an example of a, um, of a, uh, a video system deployed. This is actually from the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> and you can see um, the tremendous variety of particles in there. It's really hard to figure out what they are with the, the, the there are better and better cameras all the time. And there's different systems 
out there now to uh, really zoom in on individuals. We can get to the point of probably identifying to, certainly not to species. Species is very hard, but we can identify, we, we, can, we can tell a worm from a copepod, from a barnacle lar uh, nauplius, uh, barnacle larvae, from a crab larvae and things like that. Um, the nice thing about this is you can, you can drag it around and you can, you can cover a lot of area, whereas a net is just one single spot. Um, but you don't get the taxonomic resolution that we get from a net when we spend time with the samples. Um, and then we can also, there's also a lot of work uh, on acoustics. And from acoustics, you can get just a very basic idea. In, in this image, depth is on the x-axis and time is on the y-axis. Uh, the, the reds and yellows mean there's more stuff. We have no idea what it is. But where it's red and yellow, we know that there's more stuff than the places where it's blue and black. And the one thing you'll see in this, in this image is uh, what we call diel or diurnal vertical migration. So lots and lots of plankton come up to the surface at night, and then they go down into deeper waters during the day. And the reason they do that is because all the food, or not all the food, but the, the base of the food chain is up near the surface because that's where the light is, right? So anything that's photosynthesizing, anything that's, that's the primary producers in the system are gonna have to be near the surface where there is light. But if there is light, the bigger things with eyes can see you and they can find you and eat you. And so even though the buffet is up at the surface, you don't wanna stay at the buffet all day long because, the, because your, your enemies and your predators are gonna be able to see you and find you. So lots and lots of plankton of all different size classes do this vertical migration every single day of the year. They come up to the surface at night and they go down deep during the day in order to hide from the visual predators. Okay, so um, this is just a reminder that the things that we look at, so when we're looking at zooplankton as an ecologist, I'm looking at things like temperature, salinity of the water, the food that's available, the predators, uh, climate and weather impacts over long terms, anthropogenic impacts like deoxygenation and, and um, <coughs> uh, pollutants and all kinds of things like that. And the things we look at are species composition, timing, behavior, size, things like that. Okay, I've talked enough about that. So let's meet some plankton. I've already mentioned these guys, <coughs> but um, these are some of the protist plankton, the phytoplankton and microzooplankton. So microzooplankton tells us they're, they're, they're animals because of the zoo, and it also tells us, gives us an idea of their size. So these are gonna be uh, less than 200 microns, um, probably between 20 microns, or sorry, between two microns and 200 microns. That's the general size. And, and within that group, some of the dominants are the dinoflagellates, um, which are a single cell protist. They have two flagella, which is what makes them dinoflagellates. So they actually have one that propels them and one that steers them in most cases. So if you look at, I, can you see my um, cursor here? Okay, great. So in this one, there's a girdle band. There's this little band around the middle of the cell and there's actually a flagella coiled around that cell. There's another one that you can't see in the front and the one in the front pulls this cell along and this girdle band one wiggles around and actually steers it and helps it. So these, they, they generally swim in kind of a helical motion um, and they, they figure out and they, they, they um, steer themselves by this, this secondary flagella that's here. These are pretty slow growing organisms um, because they're actually very adaptable. So in order to be adaptable, they've got lots and lots of machinery. Their genomes are about 10 to 20 times the size of a human genome. So they have lots and lots of genes to do lots and lots of things. But because of that, because they're so adaptable, they generally grow a lot slower than a lot of the other protists in the water. Very flexible lifestyles being, uh, being mixotrophs. So a lot, some of these guys are those kleptochloroplasts a kleptochloroplastidic, meaning they'll steal those chloroplasts. Some of them are more likely to be photosynthetic. Some of them are more likely to be heterotrophic, but almost all of them, almost all of them, we can't say for sure because we haven't interviewed all of them. Um, almost all of them are gonna be mixotrophs. 
The ciliates are another group of protists, so single-celled organism. Um, almost all of them are uh, mixotrophic as well. They can be shelled, like this one in the upper middle. It has actually a, a, um, a cut, whoops, a chitinous shell around it, and it's protected. So the different, the ciliates, where the, the dinoflagellates have two flagella, the ciliates have all these little hairs, these, these individual um, hairs that they use for both locomotion and for feeding. <laughs> they'll create feeding currents to draw particles into them, um, and they'll also use them to swim. Ciliates are interesting because they have multiple nuclei. So they actually have one main nucleus that kind of tells every, that, that kind of runs the cell, but they've got these other smaller nuclei that have specific jobs in the cell. So their, their genome is actually spread out throughout these different nuclei within the cell. Um, and they're really, really fascinating. And lots of these, lot, they're, they're really, really pretty to look at under the microscope too. I should say all of these are. There's really incredible forms out there. Uh, I wanted to mention the ketogonats. These are the arrow worms. You can see that in the upper picture. This one's about two centimeters long. Um, their ketogonath means uh, spiny teeth. So their mouth is this terrifying um, maw of, of large spines that they use to grab smaller organisms and ingest them. Uh, they basically like ingest them whole and then digest them as they pass through the cell. They're mostly uh, ambush predators. So they just kind of hang in the water, not really moving until something swims by that they can, that they can see, or that they can sense and they, they eat. They don't, they don't have very strong um, uh, uh, sensory cap uh, visual capabilities. They're really, they really feed by, by sensing the pressure wave of the, of the things that are swimming past them. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the jellyfish and the, uh, the jellyfish, the sea nettles and the tinafores are the dominant ones here in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the sea nettles are, some people say, the true jellies that are related to corals and anemones and things like that. They have stinging cells that they use to stun their prey. Um, the stinging cells are on their tentacles and then they bring this, then they retract those tentacles and bring the, the prey up into their oral arms underneath here to ingest them. Tinafores are the comb jellies. They're very, very pretty. They do not have stinging cells. Um, what they do have is these rows of combs that have tiny little hairs on them or teens um, that they use for swimming and also for capturing prey. So instead of stinging cells, they have sticky cells called coloblasts that actually prey bumps into them and they get stuck and then they can pass the prey down the comb and into the, into the mouth. Um, there's a few different species in the Chesapeake Bay of uh, tinafores, and there's a few species of the, well, there's one sea nettle in the bay, and then there's a few other species of the true jellies in, in, in the Chesapeake. <laughs> so I recently worked on a paper, um, uh, a chapter of a book uh, with, with a group from the Adriatic Sea. This is actually, it was a rehashing of a book that came out about 20 years ago where we compared what was going on in the Adriatic and the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and just because I think a lot of folks here like to, um, uh, are really interested in sort of how many of the different kinds of things are out there, I wanted to include this table. Um, so if you'll notice here, there's lots and lots of hydromedusae and uh, so these first three here are all different types of Nidarian jellyfish. So these are all the true jellies, the hydromedusae, the, siphon the siph siphonophora, and the Scyphozoa. Um, we don't have nearly as many reported in the Chesapeake Bay as they had in the Adriatic. Um, the Chesapeake Bay has lots and lots of copepods compared to the Adriatic. You can see this here. Um, but I want to point out, because I'm going to come to it in a minute, um, is that within the copepods, there's lots of cryptic species complexes. So we have where we say there's one species, there's actually, there's actually likely to be multiple species. And I'm going to give an example of that. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of this, I, I take these numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt, because as I'm going to mention at the end of this, um, we don't have a zooplankton monitoring program in the Chesapeake Bay right now. There was one between uh, 1984 and 2002, but we no longer are actually monitoring for zooplankton in the Chesapeake Bay. So there's no consistent sampling for zooplankton. And in fact, a few years ago, they, they, they got rid of the, the phytoplankton sampling. That, it lasted longer than the zooplankton, but we are no longer doing uh, consistent sampling <coughs> in the bay. Um, 
I'm actually going to skip that and move ahead here. Um, and because I want to talk about why, well, I'll mention this really quickly. This is from that same uh, comparison, and this is just a, a, a compilation of the diversity data in the Chesapeake Bay for all of, for the zooplankton. So these, uh, this, these show the Simpsons Index, which is an estimate of diversity. And over here on the side, you can see the different stations where I got these data from. So this is from that 1984 to 2002 data. The take home message is the highest diversity is at station 64, which is down at the mouth of the bay. So near the saltier end of the Chesapeake Bay, we have the highest diversity of zooplankton. We see the lowest in the upper mid bay. So generally, this is a this is a pattern we see in a lot of estuaries where <clears throat> we see high diversity in the saltwater end and we see high diversity in the freshwater end. And within the estuary itself, we actually see fairly low diversity of zooplankton. And the reason for that is probably because the system is so incredibly dynamic compared to those end members. If you're in a lake and it's always fresh, there's there there's a lot more opportunity for um, diversity to, it's, it's a lot easier for a lot of different things to make a living when the conditions are a little bit more stable. Whereas in an, in an estuary, salinity changes really drastically and maintaining your osmotic, um, osmotic balance when you're surrounded by, by changing salt content is really hard for organisms. They have to work really hard to try to maintain the right salt balance in their cells. And so the organisms that can do that um, are selected for. And so we often see in the plankton that the, 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 the main part of the estuary where the salinity varies drastically has a much lower diversity than in lots of other places. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I think I'm gonna skip over that because I'm, I'm babbling on and on and on. Um, and I'm gonna skip to the fun facts. Okay, so some copepod fun facts. So currently the World Association of Copepodologists, which is a group that does, that's focused on the biology and uh, primarily the biology and taxonomy of copepods, um, has uh, about 14,300 accepted species of copepods. There's many, many, many forms of copepods. They include parasites. Uh, there are some benthic forms or particle attached forms uh, to answer the question that was asked earlier. Um, and then also the planktonic forms, the ones that are always in the plankton, um, always in the pelagic. The first um, description of what we now know, are, what we now call copepods was made by Aristotle. And he described um, <clears throat> parasitic copepods that were attached to the eyes or the gills of fish in the Aegean Sea. <coughs> So a lot of times, if, if you're a fisher, if, if you're an angler, um, and you go out and you catch a fish that has parasites attached to its gills or its eyes, many, many times those are going to be um, parasitic copepods of the uh, siphonostomid group. I mainly work on the pelagic ones, but I, so that's I'm, I'm, we're, we're getting really at the limit of my knowledge about the par parasitic ones, but they're really cool, and there's a lot of them out there. So we mentioned at the beginning that copepods might be the most abundant animal on earth. And here's how we arrived at that um, wild claim, right? So if you think about the earth covered in, th or three quarters of the earth is covered in water, okay? And if we use a calculation to estimate the surface area of the earth, uh, I'm not gonna go through the math and I don't do math in public when I can avoid it. But um, if, you, if you estimate the surface area of the earth and consider that three quarters of that surface area is water and the average depth of the ocean is about 3,800, we'll, we'll round up to 4,000 meters. Um, you wind up with 1.347 times 10 to the 21 liters of water on earth. And if we assume only one copepod per liter, which is actually a very, very, very low number compared to most of the surface waters of the ocean and especially in a lot of our uh, like for example the Chesapeake Bay we may have numbers ranging uh, up to half a million or so per per liter when at, at, at the height that's not real common but certainly one copepod per liter um, they are found copepods are found all the way to the bottom of the deepest trenches of the earth and all the way up in the highest mountain um, alpine lakes and things like that 
um, we, we, we can estimate 1.347 times 10 to the 21 copepods on Earth, approximately. So that's how we get to that. And, and I want to be clear, like we're not, we're not talking about, we're, we're, we're talking about multicellular organisms. As I said before, with this many leaders, you would add, uh, uh, you'd add quite a few zeros if you're talking about um, the, the bacteria and the viruses that are in the ocean. And um, we may not want to think about that because that's kind of icky sometimes. Yes, they can be found in bromeliads in some cases. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so some of the, there, there are some copepod that, that can be dispersed and found in some, in some, the, the water, like the water droplets in some plants and things like that. Um, and they're also found in tide pools and, and stuff like that. So almost everywhere you find water, almost everywhere you find water, um, you will find copepods. And one real quick aside about copepods is that um, uh, they showed up. So I, I had the cartoon and um, my other fun story about copepods showing up in the news is that a few years ago, um, the New York Times did a whole big story about copepods in the drinking water because um, New York City gets its water from the Catskills Mountains. And years and years ago, their water quality was degrading a little bit. And they had two choices. They could either build a multi-billion dollar treatment plant or they could buy up a whole bunch of land up in the Catskills and protect it and use it as kind of a natural filter. And New York decided to buy up a bunch of land in the Catskills and, and make it a natural filter. So their water is actually quite clean. Um, but <clears throat> um, as with all water treatment facilities, they actually have a uh, copa, copepod parts or prestate, you know, um, th there's a limit for how many copepod parts you can have in your natural water system and it still meet the criteria for drinking water. And there was a group of um, Orthodox Jews who saw this, figured out that copepods were crustaceans. Crustaceans were not kosher. And so there was a large, dis there was a discussion that was had about whether or not the water in New York City was actually kosher. <coughs> yeah, so um, they determined that, that, they, that yes, they were, they were crustaceans, but I, I don't remember the final thing. Basically, it came down to that the water was was drinkable or potable for um, for the uh, Orthodox Jews. I think I think it had to do with the fact that these were not crustaceans that were normally like eaten or or something like that. Or um, but but so so that that was but it, but there were there were three or four articles in the New York Times about it, which I thought was pretty cool. <clears throat> okay, um, Bronwyn, how am I doing? Because we're I know we're already at eight. I don't want to keep people too long if. Keep going. All right, great. People will, people will drop off, and uh, but we're 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 still we're still cooking. Okay, great. Um, so uh, now I just want to. These are some of the copods I've done most of my work on, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of them. Up here is a the one at the top is a Canthos cyclops robustus, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. This is a cyclopoid. As you can see, it carries its eggs like the one below it, which is your Tamara. Uh, this, this one up at the top is the only freshwater one here. Uh, the two at the bottom are oceanic copepods that I did my uh, dissertation work on um, and have worked on since um, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest and Puget Sound. These two are found throughout the whole Pacific Ocean, mostly along the coast, but out into the open ocean as well. And these two in the middle are the dominant copepods in Chesapeake Bay. These are estuarine or coastal copepods. The one on the right is called a Karshatansa. This is Yuri Temra, and I put SP because um, there's still some work going on for the taxonomy of this copepod group, um, and there's likely some cryptic species here. So the one in Chesapeake Bay was just recently renamed to Yuri Temra caroliae, but it's unclear how widely distributed that specific, that species is. Um, and so I just kind of am hedging my bets a little bit here as an ecologist. So the, the ones, whoop, well, I don't know why that arrow is still there, but I'm going to tell a couple quick stories about these three guys. Um, I'm sorry, that was, a, that was terrible. These three gals, in fact, because these were all female copepods. Um, so, <clears throat> well, these two are, you can tell because they're, they're brooding their eggs and that's one, that's, that's another uh, different way to differentiate and help to identify copepods is some of them brood their eggs. As you can see, Yuri Temer here carries them around in one single sack. 
Um, a lot of the cyclopoids, if not all of them, carry eggs around in two separate sacs on either side of the genital segment on their um, abdomen there. These are Akarshatansa. We're gonna talk about them the most. The one at the top, a little bit smaller, is the male. It has a little bit of a flatter head. It has an antennule that is articulated that it actually uses to grasp the female when mating because uh, fertilization is internal for copepods. So for, for all of the copepods, the, the male has to find the female. The male has to transfer a spermatophore, which is basically a sack of sperm. The female actually stores that um, in, in a... Um, in a seminal receptacle that's right on the, on the first segment of the abdomen. And then as the eggs pass through the, um, pass through that pore, they are fertilized. And so we say, uh, you'll hear me say eggs or egg production. Uh, I'm, it's wrong. That's how, that's what we say. They're actually embryos. So all of these, these uh, individual cells uh, or individual balls that you can see are actually individual embryos. They're, they're already fertilized. Um, and these two copepods on the left are brooding them. The acarsia and a lot of the other calanoids um, actually are, we call them broadcast spawners. So they release fertilized embryos into the water column. So, so fertilization happens internally um, and then the eggs are either brooded or released into the water. All right, quick aside about mosquitoes. Um, many of you probably know a lot more about um, insects than I do, um, but I had the good fortune to work with a volunteer at the lab who's no longer with us, uh, Ted Suman, who is a retired entomologist, and he came to me with an idea of working on some mosquitoes. So there are 60 species of mosquitoes in Maryland. <coughs> this is a picture of two of them. Um, this is the northern house mosquito. This is a native. This is the Asian tiger mosquito. It's a non-native. This one, the, the tiger mosquito here, most of the, the native ones are crepuscular. They only come out at dusk. Um, unfortunately, the non-native ones are really evil and they, they like to bite us all the time. Um, but there are, we, so, so, so Ted embarked on, um, on, on, a, on a, a project to see what species we had at the lab. And then he brought to me some papers that suggested that some copepods actually eat mosquito larvae. So we found four species at the lab, Aedes albopictus, Ochlorotatus japonicus, Ochlorotatus triceratus, and Toxorinichthys uh, rutilus. Um, and we actually took the larvae of a couple of those copepods, I mean, sorry, of a couple of those um, uh, mosquitoes. You can see Ted here collecting the larvae in these little cups we attached to trees. And we fed them to this copepod that we collected from a, uh, an Audubon facility near us uh, in Eastern Maryland, Pickering Creek. Um, these guys are carnivorous. The females carry their eggs around. They can overwinter as a, uh, in a dormant stage, so they can, live through the, they can live through the winter in the ponds around here. They can tolerate some brackish water. And we know that other ones related to them, other acanthocyclops groups, um, can actually eat mosquito larvae. And so this is what it looks like. They, what's, what's I think cool, if you wanna use this as a mosquito mitigation strategy is they don't, they don't eat the whole mosquito larvae. They basically like take a chunk out of it and then go swim away and find another one. So they just kill the mosquito larvae. <coughs> um, it's terrible if you're a mosquito larvae. Let's, let's acknowledge that. But um, if, it's, if, it, if you're gonna use it as a, as a um, mitigation strategy, it's, it's actually quite helpful. So we did some experiments with different numbers of mosquito larvae, and you can see here, um, when there were few, um, when there were only a few mosquito larvae fed to the adults, um, they ate a lot of them, up to 75% of the larvae were eaten when, when there wasn't a real dense amount. When there's lots and lots of larvae, they still ate them, but they weren't as, able to do as much, of, put as much of a dent on the larvae population. So unfortunately, so there are places in the world where this actually works. Um, in Southeast Asia, in, um, in Vietnam and Cambodia, they actually grow uh, different species of copepods and they deliver them to people um, to put in their cisterns where they collect um, rainwater and things like that. So anywhere you have standing water where you might breed mosquitoes, you could actually introduce these to them. They're harmless to, to us. Um, and you can actually raise them on, um, uh, they, they'll eat uh, like little protists and paramecium uh, and ciliates and things like that. 
the, the larvae will eat, will eat little things that sort of grow, the, the film that grows on the side of the cisterns. So you can get a reproducing population in, in a cistern. We weren't able to really come up with a good way to do it on the Eastern shore, um, but we did find out that they, that they will eat them. And that was, um, that was pretty cool. And if somebody else, or, or you know, if, if we can figure out, figure out how to make it work as a deployable strategy, uh, it, it would certainly, I think, be favorable to some of the sort of chemicals and things that uh, the broad spectrum insecticides and things that we're using these days. So, okay, so uh, just a little bit about Akarsha tansa. So this is the, I don't know if it's my favorite, but um, it's the copepod I've done the most work on in the last uh, 16 years or so. Um, and they, this, this taxa is found all over the, the world. Um, it's in, in coastal and estuarine systems. So, so there's members of this genus that are found in the open ocean, but most of the, most members of the genus are found in coastal and estuarine systems from the Arctic all the way to the lower latitudes. So this particular species is found, um, all the way from like say up in up off of Nova Scotia, all the way down through um, Brazil and Argentina. So you find them everywhere and throughout the Caribbean. I actually found them in Puerto Rico. Um, I found this exact same species in Puerto Rico in the Bioluminescent Bay. So we talked a little bit about size. I just want to highlight that within even one taxa here, like Akarsha tansa, we have a huge range of sizes. They go through. 13 stages, um, three or four orders of magnitude in terms of length or weight. It takes, at, in the summer, it takes about seven to 10 days to go from egg to fully grown reproductive adult. Uh, it's it's the, the development time, the time to go through each of these stages is largely temperature dependent. It's also a little bit food dependent, but largely temperature dependent. So the warmer it is, the faster they go through these stages. In the winter, this would take a month or maybe 40 days or so. Um, but in the summer, they, we, we can grow them in the lab at uh, room temperature and, and bring them from egg to adult uh, in, about, in about 10 days. The picture in the middle, again, are the, the male and female. The female is a little bit bigger. The male has the, the flatter head and the, we call it, uh, the term is geniculate antenna. So it's got this this articulated antenna that it uses to grasp the female. The first six stages are called the noplier stages. So these are the larval stages. It's kind of like a little ball with legs. Um, as it goes through the stages, it actually adds a couple of swimming legs. Um, then there's a metamorphosis period um, that takes a little bit longer. It takes a little bit longer to go from the sixth noplier stage to the first copepidite stages. Um, these ones that are that are that where the body plan is similar to the adults are all called copepidites. Uh, there's five uh, juvenile copepidite stages and then the adult stage where they're reproductively active. For some species, you can actually tell males and females in the later copepidite stages, the fourth and fifth. With a carsha, with without really uh, without like staining them and looking for the um, the ovaries or testes, you really can't tell if it's gonna be a male or a female until um, they get to that, uh, to, to the adult stage. And there is some evidence that, um, that, that sex is not genetically determined in some copepods. So we find some females with um, male secondary sexual characteristics on the antennae um, or on other parts of the body and, and vice versa. And so, um, there, there have been a few experiments done with other species where you grow them. If you, if you keep them isolated, if you keep them isolated, you get all females. If you grow them up together, you get a, a more even distribution of males and females. So there's something going on that's, um, that's we, we, and this happens in lots of other species, as I'm sure you guys know, you know turtles and, and lots of other things. So you, can, you can affect sex ratios um, by, the, by the environmental conditions. But so the same thing happens with, um, with copepods. So we say this is one species, but this is, I think, the really interesting. This is one of the things that really interests me is that um, there, there was a group, um, <clears throat> Gong Chen and Matt Hare. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, Molly. Um, <clears throat> Gong Chen and Matt Hare did some genetic work on the copepods in Chesapeake Bay, and they found that there's actually different lineages. So these are we call them cryptic species because morphologically they are complete; they're indistinct. 
in, in more than just gross morphological features. Now there's probably some feature uh, on, the, uh, on one of the legs, you know, there's probably something that can distinguish them, but for gross morphological features, they are completely indistinguishable, but they are different sizes. And so the chart on the left shows you um, the different lineages. We call them F, X, and S. And the F lineage are found in, they separate by salinity. So F are the more freshwater, S are the more saltwater, and then there's this weird one that they called X, which, which exists in these sort of middle salinities. And unfortunately, they, um, they switched our color um, between these two sets of graphs, they switched the color coding. Um, but over here, you can see that generally the, the F lineage is smaller than the S lineage. And in spring, when it's cooler than in summer, um, we generally get smaller organisms, but the X lineage does not change that much in terms of size uh, with temperature as the other two lineages do. So as expected, these are the males on the bottom and the females on the top. Um, <clears throat> so males are smaller than females and they're smaller in the summer than they are in the winter. And that is something that we see with almost all of the invertebrate zooplankton that we find in um, pretty much anywhere, that they're actually smaller at higher temperatures. And the reason for that I think is pretty interesting and it's because development rate is, is controlled by temperature, but, but feeding and growth are not as controlled by temperature. So in other words, they're, as, as it gets warmer, they're developing through these stages much faster. And so they're not spending as much time in a given stage putting on weight. And so their size is smaller at warmer temperatures because they're progressing so fast through those stages. They're just not, not bulking up, right? So, so generally speaking, we see the largest animals um, are the ones that are grown in colder temperatures in the winter and the smaller animals of the same taxa are found in the summer. So this is just more of that data. This is just specifically within the Chesapeake Bay, um, which, of these, um, which of these two lineages are found where. I won't, um, the, the take home message here is that we have these F lineages, these freshwater lineages that are found higher up in the tributaries, higher up in the Chesapeake Bay, closer to the freshwater. So there's, they're, they, they're, they're definitely different groups within the Chesapeake Bay at a very small scale in addition to the large scale. So our lab, my, my grad student, um, Catherine Fitzgerald, this isn't, wasn't even actually, this was when she was a technician working for me, but we did some crosses. So we, we were able to get different cultures growing by isolating uh, individuals and growing up eggs um, in culture and then doing the genetic, um, doing genetic testing to determine which one was the F lineage and which one was the S lineage. And we grew them at a salinity that we knew they would both grow at, um, sort of a moderate salinity. And we did crosses. We took female Fs and, and male Ss and vice versa and we, we let them uh, mate and then produce eggs. And what we found was there wasn't really much of a, on the left shows the number of eggs produced on the, on the um, Y axis and the X axis shows the F and the S lineage, uh, the, the crosses. So the blue are F and F, the red are S and S, and then the S by F lineage, the gray is where we took the two different lineages and we, and we, we, um, we mated them. And so these were ones that these we knew they were they were uh, virgin males and females because we raised them up in, in little tiny individual containers. We had million felt like millions of these little jars in the um, in the environmental chamber. Um, we didn't see a lot of difference in egg production, no matter who made it. But the crosses between the two different lineages didn't hatch. And that was really, really exciting. And it actually fulfills the biological species concept, right? That these are not, these are reproductively isolated. So we know that they can mate, but their, their progeny actually don't survive at all. So it's likely that they're different species, okay? This is, this is the definition of it. However, <clears throat> the only reason I'm not saying that is because we haven't done the due diligence to do the taxonomy to really find what the, what the, uh, we know that there are some molecular differences, but these are really in um, uh, in, in molecular markers that are that um, 
are used to differentiate taxa, but they're not necessarily telling us anything about why they're incompatible. We don't know why these eggs don't hatch. We don't know if it's if it's pre or post fertilization, for example, like maybe the maybe the sperm of of the of the lineages are, are incompatible with the eggs of the other lineage. Um, we don't know if it's something mechanical about when they try to transfer the sperm that's keeping it out. So so I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to go too too far until we really do the really dig. But we did get this published, and, and I think it's really cool that these are likely um, we call them putative uh, species. <coughs> It, we also found that the, the, the uh, elemental content's a little bit different. So um, the, the S lineage are always bigger and, and their C to N ratio is a lot different. So over here in this table, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, that's important because it might point to different strategies for storing lipids, okay? The lipids are high carbon molecules and are really important for trophic transfer up to fish and things like that. And what we're seeing is that the S lineage has lots more carbon than the uh, F lineage does, which suggests that it might, be, it might be using, and that may have to do with osmotic regulation. There's a lot of different things. A lot of, a lot of cook buds use uh, cholesterol and other lipids to actually um, adjust their cell membranes in order to, uh, to maintain the osmotic potential between them. So, um, so we're still looking into this, the, the, um, but, but there's, there's really big differences between these two groups that look exactly the same and that for a long time we didn't even know existed. Uh, just a quick slide to show you that there's a lot of work being done on this group. This is from uh, Diego Figueroa, who's in Texas, and he's looking at the whole suite of them all everywhere from Brazil up to the North, Northwest Atlantic. And, and the, the original work showed that there were three clades. Well, there's probably seven or eight clades, the more that we dig into this. Um, <clears throat> so there's probably a lot more differentiation of what we thought for a long time was one single species. And it's not just with Akarsha. Oh shoot, I meant to put the name. The other dominant copepod in, um, uh, in, in Chesapeake Bay is Yuri Temra. And it has been shown to uh, have a really weird distribution genetically, which suggests that it has invaded, it, it's been an invasive species in lots of places. And there's also suggested suggestions because it's got some very closely related, um, there's some closely related species in freshwater that this copepod has invaded, has, has started in saltwater, invaded freshwater, and then reinvaded the saltwater over geologic time and over the time of the, the species. Um, this is a really, this is, I, I fought for a while whether or not I wanted to keep this in, but it, it has to do with Venice. And so I thought that was kind of cool and I'm gonna just go over it very quickly. So, so invasions are an important part of the plankton story these days, and especially with the zooplankton. Places like uh, San Francisco Bay have seen huge, um, huge changes in the species composition of the zooplankton. And they've only known that because they're doing all this monitoring. But we have seen the same thing in the uh, in Venice. The, the folks in Venice who've been monitoring for a long time have seen the same thing. These charts show the rank species abundance. So basically, the ones on the left that are a little bit higher, look, just look at the open circles. This shows the, the rank of species based on abundance from all the plankton samples uh, in the inlet areas the intermediate areas, and then in the shallow areas, so inlet, intermediate, and shallow, over three different decades. The first column is the 1970s and 80s. The second column is 90s to 2000s, and the 2000s is 2010s is on the right column. I put the little orange arrows on there just to highlight that Akarsha Tansa, the one that we now know is at least two, two groups in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, was not present in Venice in the 1970s, but showed up in the 1990s, by the 1990s at least, and is now the dominant, in, dominant um, taxa in the zooplankton samples, in the, in the shallow waters and in the intermediate waters. It doesn't seem to persist out in the Adriatic Sea, even in the shallow waters right outside of Venice. Um, it's there, but it doesn't seem to be, it, ha it hasn't overtaken some of the native uh, the natives are represented by the yellow and the red dots on here, um, but it has established itself within the, the Venetian lagoons. 
<clears throat> and so these things are being transported around in, in the holds of ships and ballast water and, 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 and sometimes maybe along with our seafood and things like that. Um, but uh, the only way we find them is through, is through monitoring and things like that. So I've just got like two slides left. Um, I talk a lot. I hope that's okay. I've, been, I've enjoyed this. I hope you have too. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple words about the status of the zooplankton in the bay. Monitoring, uh, as I mentioned, occurred from 84 to 2002. There was an attempt at a revival in 2011. It didn't, um, there, so we have samples and, and counts from 2011, but it, but it didn't really go beyond that. Um, and I just want to note that the zooplankton has been taken out of the Bay Program model because there's a lack of data. So there's, a, there's an ecosystem model for the Bay Program, and they basically are, are throwing their hands up regarding zooplankton because uh, we just don't have the data. So this is, this is a, 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 a bald push to, uh, to, to that we need this kind of data, and lots of groups really want it, the fish folks, the crab folks. Um, it is expensive, and it's it's and it is a big effort. But um, I do think I do think the places where we've done it, um, we've learned a lot. Um, but there's a lot of work still going on. We're doing a lot of process studies, looking at zooplankton as fish food, looking at the dead zones and zooplankton um, in terms of larval transport, how they get around the bay. I'm going to skip over that. Um, and then <coughs> just the final thing to tie it up with the food web of the bay. Um, I do a lot of work on hypoxia and um, it's stressors such as hypoxia and temperature, um, these long-term processes that are changing the bay that can really restructure the food web um, and lead to some really long-term changes. And there was a good paper by Dave Kimmel that identified a lot of the, um, uh, the long-term trends in the Chesapeake Bay region and how the food web has changed in response to some of those environmental changes. And how they, there, there are some, you know, because it's so closely um, the, the food web is, uh, ooh, I'll get to that question in a second. Um, uh, the, the food web is very tightly coupled here. And so stressors like oxygen and temperature can affect one part of the food web. And there may be nonlinear or sort of unexpected changes at other parts of the food web because of how, how closely it's connected. <clears throat> so if you're into this, um, there's, there's, these are just some of my favorite, um, uh, little videos. These are short. Um, there are some of my uh, short little videos about plankton. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, they're focused largely on zooplankton. But um, the biological pump is one. Uh, uh, actually, uh, a student who she was she was a student of mine, and now she's um, faculty out in California, um, and she put this together about the biological pump. Basically, how all the productivity at the surface gets down to the deep water. Um, and then uh, this, the story, the secret life of plankton is one of my favorites. This is a TED, uh, a TED Ed talk. Um, it's really, really well done. It's got beautiful photography that, um, that, that I wish I had done. Um, and then the Plankton Chronicles is, is stories of individual plankton. And I would, I'd recommend the one on Franima, uh, which is an amphipod, a deep sea amphipod that was the model for uh, the alien in the movie Aliens. So um, that's a cool one, and it's, it's a fun little video. All right. Yes, Xenomorph, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's all I have. Um, and yes, citizen science, uh, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how we can do it, um, but I am thinking about it. Um, so so uh, that was uh, Ruan. Um, yes, I am thinking about how we can do citizen science for zooplankton monitoring. There is a group that does it for phytoplankton. Um, as you go up in taxonomic levels, it gets slightly more complicated, but we should be able to figure this out. And, um, and I'd, I'd be absolutely interested in talking to anybody who would like to um, help me help figure it out. Thanks. This was great. Um, Jamie, do you want to stop the share? We can come back together. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so, so much. We have gone uh, uh, on an undersea adventure to the, to, the, to the base of our food chain, and I love it. Because we don't have to have that appreciation for what is the foundation of, 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 that everything else is built upon. Um, so I, I really, really appreciate that. And I agree with Ruana when you were talking about that, there has to be a way to involve with community science, either with 
the, the photography, the videos that they're coming on and they're getting better. And, and I know that it, we do a community science Saturday every month. So we're linking volunteers with different projects. So I've been doing a lot of uh, uh, playing around with what's out there, trying to get connect people. But um, I'll stop talking. Any other questions for Dr. Pearson? I have a ton, but I'll, I'll, I, I'll wait. I, I have one. Go ahead, yeah. Krista. Okay. I, um, so we've learned a lot about nanoplastics and microplastics in the ocean. Have you found them in the bay as well, or have you looked for them that are actually in plankton? They're so small that plankton can ingest them. That's right. Um, we, so um, there's, there are a couple groups. There's, there's, there's uh, somebody at, at College Park who has done a little bit of sampling in this regard, looking at microplastics. They definitely come up in our nets and you know, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, but, you know, we've been focused on process studies. We haven't really quantified them in the past. Um, fortunately, I've hung on to most of those samples. Um, they're in the bay for sure. I can't say to what level. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how many. Um, and it's interesting you brought that up because I currently have four proposals that I'm waiting to hear about um, working with some other colleagues at uh, UMSEs to um uh, to to look specifically at this now now we're the the it's interesting that the calls recently have all been about like transport and fate of these plastics like where are they going how are they moving where are they coming from like sources and sinks and things like that um, and we do have a grad student who's looking at oyster larvae feeding on microplastics um, a, through a bunch of lab laboratory studies. Um, and I think the, the good, and her work is coming out soon. Um, I know some of it's already been submitted um, for publication. The, the, the take home message is that at, at the concentration, so the few studies have been done, we don't see a big negative effect on the oyster larvae at the concentrations that we have seen so far. Um, now that is only with, but, but you know, a lot of these experiments are done with very specific targeted um, controlled microplastics. So, so it, you know, it's hard to make a direct connection to what the larvae in the water are actually, are, are actually experiencing. But um, uh, it, it's definitely something that's going on. The, the Chesapeake Bay program has a plastic pollution action team that they've started up um, and I've started talking to, and it's, it's people from, uh, from, from all throughout the Chesapeake Bay region that are starting to talk about this. So, so I think there's going to be more and more coming out about plastics and microplastics in the Bay. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Pearson? I was wanting to know about the why, what, what is the strategy or what's the advantage of having such a large DNA for a dinoflagellate? So, so they're 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 really weird. Let's we'll, we'll start there, and um, they have a lot of different metabolic pathways to use lots of different things, uh, lot, lots of different foods. So they can they can metabolize lots of different things that they ingest, um, which gives them sort of a broad spectrum prey. They're not you know focused on on certain things, um, and. They do a really weird thing. So I'm, I'm gonna get into the weeds in biology for just a second. Um, so, so there's a new field in molecular ecology of um, fairly new of uh, transcriptomics. So the way that we build enzymes is you take the DNA and you transcribe it and then you translate that transcription. Okay, so those are the, those are the basic steps. Okay, and there's different, there's different parts of the cell that are involved in that. Um, <clears throat> So most organisms on earth, um, they control which enzymes are, are operating at the transcription level. So in other words, they're, they're not reading all the DNA all the time. They're only reading the parts of, so you know, if, you, if you eat a carrot versus if you eat a piece of chicken, you know, there's different, there, there's certain, and that's a really simplified, but let's just go with it for a second, right? There's different, there's different processes that are involved in metabolizing those, those different things. And if, if you eat a carrot, you know, like the, your, your body's only going to make the, the enzymes to deal with that while the carrot's there. And then if you later eat chicken, it's going to stop making carrot stuff into 
Dinoflagellates transcribe everything all the time. Like they're, they're like constantly ready. So, so they've got, you can't do transcriptomics in, which is which is like how you interrogate what's being transcribed in order to see what what the organism is is dealing with or what stresses it's dealing with or what it's eating or things like that. Dinoflagellates have no transcriptional control. They're constantly transcribing their DNA, but the enzymes they're building, the translational control is where is where all of their their regulatory processes are occurring. So so they're that's how they're able to respond to things. But it also means they're working really hard and they're constantly transcribing all of this DNA all the time. Um, the, the advantage, I think, is just that they've got a ton of machinery kind of ready to go. But it's, it's kind of like everything's, you know, all the lights are on all the time. And so the, you know, the, the, it's, it's sucking up a lot of energy for them. Um, and I think there's a lot of junk DNA in there too. So the size of their DNA, I think is a lot of junk and also repeated. So they, they, there's a lot of pseudo genes. So um, the, these would be um, DNA sequences that are really closely related to something that works, but it doesn't quite work because there's some, some, uh, some junk sequences say in the middle or something like that. So, so the, the, there, we think there might be a, they might be a pretty ancient lineage. And now I'm getting a little bit out of my depth, but I'm just gonna go for it. Um, and that um, th they have probably absorbed uh, like tons and tons of DNA from other groups. And then other groups have evolved to sort of simplify and streamline with very specialized, um, uh, with, with very specialized processes. Whereas the, the dinoflagellates might be more like generalists that are, that are kind of producing everything all the time. Do you see the, the question down there in the chat? Yes. So, so uh, Ron's asking about bioaccumulation affecting the decline in health, uh, perhaps observed in, in shellfish. Um, yeah. So that, I, th I think it's possible um, because, because along with, you know, one of the things about the, the microplastics is it's not, you know, I think we think of like a clean little piece of plastic floating around in the water, but that thing that's been floating around in the water for a really long time is a carbon-based um, particle. And there's there, lots of things might stick to it. Um, a lot of times they're, um, they're polarized. And so, you, so contaminants uh, and other things could stick to it. So if you, even if the particles themselves, um, yeah, I think, I think that that's a good point. So like BPA, um, harm, something like that, might be, so it might be, um, it might not be just the plastic that's disrupting them, um, or they might be sequestering the plastic. It also might be that they now have to deal with, so if, so if I eat a whole bunch of plastic, I'm not getting any nutrition and it's passing through me, but my body has to work on that stuff, right? And so, so the same thing might be happening with some of the, um, with some of the plankton as they're ingesting those microplastics. It's not necessary. It may not even necessarily be directly negative, you know, one piece of plastic, but it's it's an it's an effort for the body to to deal with it, which is going to cause a decline in the efficiency. Of, yeah, like a cumulative decline in the efficiency of the organism. So um, there's a lot of people working on this right now. I don't think we have any concrete. Um, we, we don't have a lot concrete we can say. I mean, we know that if you dump a ton of plastic into a jar of plankton, probably gonna smother them and kill them, right? But at the levels in the, in the bay and weathered, you know, weathered and accumulating all the other stuff that it's bumping into um, is a lot harder to study. So um, I, the next couple of years, there's gonna be a ton of work on plastics. Um, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot. Um, we're gonna learn a lot about what we don't know too. Um, I hope that I hope that answered your question a little bit. Well, that's what that's that's the the joy of science. The more you learn, the more you learn that you don't. The more it right. Is. Well, right. Keeps us in business for sure. No, no. Right. Right. The more that you know, the more that you don't know. Right. Uh, well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening, and special thanks to Dr. Pearson for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us. 
um, and just for your work that you're doing um, to understand um, this important component of our of our uh, of our natural world. Um, and hopefully we maybe if you do you get if you decide that it's a, a separate um, species, then maybe you get to name that those species, and that would be kind of cool. It would, it would be. If I do that, dude, if I if I do all the work of dissecting a thousand individuals apart, and... <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I hope that everybody stays well, stays safe, stays curious, and also um, come and join us next week to see Rachel Carson live at the museum for Earth Day. I mean, what else is the best, best thing? Well, Obviously, go out and explore outside during the day, and then join us in the evening uh, with, to hear about to hear from Rachel Carson. Uh, that'll be wonderful next week for Earth Day. Uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thanks very much, Brian. Thank you.